Thunderbolt is one of three classic wooden roller coasters at Kennywood, and I think it's the best of the trio. This coaster originally opened 100 years ago as the Pippin, but it was extensively modified and transformed into Thunderbolt four decades after it opened. In this video, I will explain everything that makes this coaster so special. Kennywood has always had an affinity for wooden roller coasters. The park added four wood coasters between 1904 and 1911, but these were side friction coasters, meaning they had no upstop wheels. This meant that the coasters were limited as to how much negative G's they could exert, or else the cars could jump the track. John Miller invented and patented the upstop wheel in 1919. This would be an extra set of wheels underneath the track that would prevent the train from leaving the track. Just one year later in 1920, Kennywood and John Miller added one of the first roller coasters with upstop wheels in Jackrabbit. This wood coaster featured a few dips down a ravine, including the double dip. This special double down still offers one of the craziest airtime moments in the world. The combination of ejector airtime and minimalistic restraints is magical. This ride was so popular that Kennywood and John Miller built an even bigger version of the ride in 1924. Named the Pippin, this ride also featured four drops down a ravine, one of which was also a double dip. In the 1960s, Kennywood wanted to diversify their offerings. In an unprecedented move, they converted Pippin into Thunderbolt. Andy Vitell, who was the park's head of maintenance, is credited as the lead designer. Most of the drops remained. However, the double down was modified into one single drop. Then the coaster added a helix section in between drops 2 and 3. This would double the ride's length and add strong lateral forces not found in the park's other coasters. This was a gamble, but it paid off. For decades, Thunderbolt was considered one of the world's best wood coasters. The ride still rates highly in annual coaster polls, and it's beloved by locals. The ride has been modified three additional times over the years. First, there was an unbanked airtime hill at the start of the helix section in the ride's opening year. This hill was deemed too extreme, and was removed after just one year. Second, the ride was modified when Steel Phantom was built in 1991. Steel Phantom's second drop pierced right through Thunderbolt's support structure, creating one of the scariest near misses of any coaster. Additionally, the tunnel after Thunderbolt's first drop was removed to provide better views of the new coaster. Third, the ride was modified when Steel Phantom was transformed into Phantom's Revenge. This hypercoaster pierced through the support structure of Thunderbolt a second time while climbing out of the ravine. Thunderbolt has such a cool look to it. It has a white support structure like so many old woodies, and the red handrails are a nice touch. The helix section is front and center. It runs adjacent to the main pathways. Then the entrance and queue line were placed in the middle of this section, so you see the coaster cycling all around you. It is a neat visual that gets you excited for your ride. The ravine drops are not visible from the main midway though. Then I love this ride station. It bears the ride's name in big letters. You do not want to get stuck in this queue line a hot sunny day. It is a large set of tight, uncovered switchbacks. Fortunately, the wait time tends to be less than the park's other wood coasters. Usually, I don't wait more than 15 to 20 minutes. I think there are two reasons for this. One, this ride is one of the highest height restrictions for any wood coaster across the globe. Guests must be at least 52 inches tall to ride. Compare that to Jackrabbit and Racer that have 42 inch and 46 inch height requirements respectively. Two, Thunderbolt is solid capacity. It often runs two trains, each holding 24 riders. The restraints are simple to check, and there are separate load and unload platforms. If the ride does have a lengthy wait, it is included in the park's paid speedy pass skip the line system. This allows you to bypass the switchbacks and proceed immediately to the station. Now this ride famously does not allow single riders. There's a big sign stating this at the entrance. This is because of the intense lateral forces and lack of seat dividers. If you are alone or in an odd numbered group, the ride staff will help you out. I have seen them do a variety of things. Sometimes they will call for another single rider or odd numbered party from the station or queue line. 
Sometimes they will ask one lucky rider on the unload platform if they want to ride again, and in rare cases, a ride attendant will take a spin themselves. The maintenance crew also used to famously ride Thunderbolt as part of their morning routine. An employee would stand in the front row and lean over the edge with an oil can to grease the track. Now I'm guessing this practice is no longer done today, but it's still a sight to behold in the old Kennywood documentary. This rides three trains from the National Amusement Device Company. These are retro, metallic trains with a distinctive appearance. Each row is a shared single position lap bar that rests high above the lap of most riders, similar to PTC buzz bars. For many years, that was the coaster's only restraint, but seat belts were added in 2017. Riders are free to select any row they'd like in the station. The front gets the single strongest airtime moment on the ride, but I think the coaster is best overall on the back car. Two additional seating considerations. First, this rise intense lateral forces. Whoever sits on the left side of the train will get crushed by the other rider, so it's wise to put the smaller guest on the right side. Second, wheel seats offer bumpier rides. Now this coaster is very smooth in the first two rows of any coaster. The third row of any car is bumpier, but it is still quite smooth and completely comfortable because of the train's padding. This rise in excellent condition given its age. Once checked, Thunderbolt begins by rolling forwards. Then you drop down the ravine for the first of four times. This surprises many first-timers. This drop is roughly four stories tall, and it has a nice head chopper with Phantom's drop overhead. And those in back get a decent pop of airtime as well. You then have a turnaround. The entry offers a little airtime in the front car. Then the turn, while really slow, is completely unbanked, so it has a smidge of laterals. The drop off this turnaround only drops down part of the ravine. It is on the smaller side, and it offers no negative Gs. Then you rise upwards towards the lift hill, but not before the track sharply levels off. This delivers a powerful burst of ejector airtime in the front car. It is a shocking moment. Those in the back car get a little lift, but nothing compared to those up front. You then have the ride's lone lift hill. This is not too disruptive to the pacing because it occurs shortly after the ride starts, and a majority of the layout still remains. I view the first bit as a pre-lift section. The end of the lift hill offers a nice view of the park. Then you turn right towards the helix section. This starts with a straight drop that's roughly 50 feet, or 16 meters in size. It offers weak floater airtime in the back car, and it builds up enough speed for the rest of the layout. You were then abruptly slammed left, and the ride will forcibly pin you there for the next 15 to 20 seconds. It is one of the best sequences of laterals of any coaster, between their power and duration. The whole section is barely any banking. There are three hills mixed in. These don't offer airtime, but they add some variety. The laterals momentarily lessen at the apex, but they spike once again in the pullouts. This section ends with a twisted climb upwards. At this point, you get a brief break from the laterals. You then have a short straightaway through a covered shed. There is a trim break here that'll take some speed away, but it does not spoil the finale. You still have the ride's two largest drops by far. The first one is roughly 70 feet, or 22 meters in size. And this is my favorite element on the ride in the back car. The drop begins by curving left. This offers good laterals, especially in that back car. Then the drop straightens out and sharply plunges down the ravine. The second the laterals subside, those in the back car get standing airtime. This was especially crazy before the seat belts were added, but it's still excellent today. Then as icing on the cake, there's a fantastic head chopper with Phantom's drop once again. The clearance is even tighter this time around. Then there's a large turnaround rising up the other side of the ravine. Those in front get some weak floater at the apex. Then the turn offers a great view looking down the ravine, and it also offers some laterals between the lack of braking and compactness. Then comes the final drop, which is the largest of the ride at 90 feet, or 27.5 meters in size. It is so bizarre having a drop this large at the end of the layout, but it works here, 
and those in the back car get some decent floater airtime. It's an exciting finale. You then climb up the other side of the ravine, no airtime, and then you hit the brakes. You then round a corner and return to the unload platform, ending the 3,250 foot or 990 meter long experience. Outside the brief pause for the lift hill, this is a nicely paced coaster. The elements are all engaging between the airtime pops, terrain use, and laterals. Now I also need to share a weird story that occurred in this coaster. I had my single most violent coaster rides ever on Thunderbolt several years ago. In one of my visits, I was a single rider and I was paired up with a bunch of rowdy teens. Once the ride began, they started fighting each other. They were pushing each other, slapping each other, using their hoodies to choke each other, and all sorts of general roughhousing. Why they decide to do that on a coaster beats me. Then when we returned to the station, the staff members, who were completely oblivious to the whole situation, sent us around a second time, and round two of fighting began. Fortunately, they kept me out of it, but I have no clue why they decided to turn this classic ride into a battleground. So, what would I rate Thunderbolt? I would give this old wood coaster an 8 out of 10. This is a great ride with a lot of character. The helix section offers incredible laterals that few rides can match. Then I love how the ride's largest drops travel down the ravine and also offer good airtime in the rear rows. There are other wood coasters that do better in the airtime department, but Thunderbolt does fine in this area, especially given the minimalistic restraints. This is my favorite of the park's three wood coasters because it offers the most intense and consistent rides start to finish, and it is a must ride each visit. So those are my thoughts on Thunderbolt at Kennywood. What are your thoughts about this ride? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you considered subscribing, because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.